Take a couple of good long, deep in and out breaths. And notice where you feel the breathing in the body. It may be in an unexpected place, but wherever you feel it, focus your attention there. The breath is potentially a whole body process. In the beginning, you want to focus on the parts that are obvious. And if long breathing feels good, keep it up. If it doesn't feel good, you can change. Make it shorter or shallow. Try in long, out short, in short, out long. In long, out short tends to be energizing. In short, out long tends to be more relaxing. Ask yourself, what does your body need right now? You can also try fast, slow, heavy, light. You can assess what the body needs and how you can provide for those needs by the way you breathe. When you find a rhythm that feels good, stick with it until it doesn't feel good so anymore, because the needs of the body will change. So keep on top of what the body needs. If there are any thoughts that come to the mind, you don't have to follow them. The breath is always coming in and going out. The thoughts don't disturb the breath. Our problem is that we leave the breath, focus on the thoughts. If you do find that happening, just drop the thought. Don't try to finish it. Just let it go with its ends dangling. Come right back to the breath. No matter how many times you wander off, just keep coming back, coming back. When you come back each time, reward yourself with a breath that feels especially good. That way the mind will be more and more inclined to want to come back. And settle in. And as the breath feels comfortable, sometimes there is a tendency to blur out, or to focus on the comfort and center of the breath, in which case you lose the foundation for your concentration. So you find that happening. The next step is to be aware of the whole body as you breathe in and breathe out. And a good way to build up that whole body awareness is to go through the body first, section by section, and start down around the navel. Focus your awareness there. Watch it for a while as you breathe in, breathe out to see what rhythm of breathing feels good there. If there's any tension or tightness in that part of the body, allow it to relax. So that no new tension builds up as you breathe in, You're not holding on to any tension as you breathe out. Stay there for a while, then move up to the solar plexus, the middle of the chest, base of the throat, the middle of the head. Be especially careful with the middle of the head. Don't put too much pressure on the nerves of the head. Think of the breath coming in freely from all directions, very gently working through any patterns of tension you may feel in the forehead, the jaws, the back of the head. Gradually working through any patterns of tension there and allowing them to dissolve away. Then you can think of the breath coming into the back of the neck, going down the shoulders and the arms, coming into the back of the neck, going down the back, out the legs. You can survey the, the body this way as many times as you like. Even if you're an old hand in meditation, it's good to make a body survey like this once a day just to see what needs to be done. To give the mind a good place to stay. Because we want to be as much aware of the present moment as possible. And if you can create a sense of ease and well-being in the present moment, it's a lot easier to see what's going on. Because we're always forming our intentions, our desires, right here. And if we're not present for them, then they go on automatic pilot. 
and you basically lose control of the big factor that's shaping your life, which is the question, which intentions do you want to act on? There are some things you'd like to do, but you know will get bad results down the line. So you have to learn how to say no to those intentions. Other things you may not like to do, but they give good results in the long term. You have to learn how to talk the mind into wanting to do those things. You can really see this clearly only if you're here solidly. When you can do this, it's, it's a gift not only to yourself, but also to the people around you. Because you'd be more likely to act on harmless intentions. And the simple fact that your mind is steady and at ease. You're sending off a different energy. We had a death in the community yesterday. We stop and think about the people who passed away. We think about their good habits, the good example they set. And you want to do something for them. And it's standard throughout the world that when someone has passed away, they do things. One, for the sake of the person who's passed away, and two, for the sake of the people who are here. When the person who's passed away, one of the best things you can do is get the mind into good concentration, think thoughts of goodwill to that person. Because the mind, when it's steady, is sending off a good energy. When it's concentrated like this, it's a good gift to be sending out. You think of Shotai, wherever she is right now, may she be happy. May she reap the, result, the results of all the good she's done. But at the same time, we Think about the people who passed away as a way of warning ourselves. As the Buddha said, the source of all goodness, the source of all skillful actions, is heedfulness. The realization that your actions really do matter, and they really do make a difference between happiness and suffering, pleasure and pain. And as in Shotai's case, her death was totally unexpected. There was no illness leading up to it. Seems to have been an accident. There's no forewarning. The sun didn't rise with her name on it that morning. And the same for us. We have no idea when we're going to go. And the question is, what are you going to take with you when you go? And how are you going to face the prospect of having to leave this body? You're going to need a lot of good mental qualities. And you're going to need to be able to Keep your mind under some control. So that's what we're learning here as we get the mind to settle down. Because other thoughts will come up and you have to learn how to say no. And sometimes it's easy to say no, and sometimes it's not so easy. Some of those thoughts have hooks. So you're going to be able to catch the mind in time before it starts weaving more of those thoughts. Get back to see, well, what's the hook? The Buddha calls this asada. The Pali term means allure. Sometimes it's translated as gratification. Some thoughts come up and they just go right past you. Other thoughts have a real allure, and they may or may not be skillful. The amount of the allure has no measure of how good that particular thought will be for your long-term happiness. And some of the thoughts are brand new, and others are old thoughts you've thought many, many times in the past. So you have to put the mind in a position where it can question the allure. This is another one of the reasons why we concentrate and try to get a sense of well-being in the present moment. The sense of being solidly here. When you feel solid, you feel safe, secure. Then you can look at these thoughts 
and question the allure. And you're in a position where you can question it. If the mind is hungry, dissatisfied, ill at ease, it doesn't question things that it finds appealing. It just goes for the appeal. But as we put the mind in a good shape like this, centered but broad, because after you've done your survey of the body, you can settle down to one spot. Choose any spot in the body you'd like. And then think of your awareness spreading throughout the whole body. And then think of the whole body breathing in, the whole body breathing out, out to every pore. And however long it takes to do that, and however long you want to stay here, that's perfectly fine. Just getting the mind concentrated like this, with a broad range of awareness, but a clear center. It's healing for the body and it's healing for the mind. It's like a medicine, like a cream you put on a rash. You don't put the cream on and then wipe it right off. You put the cream on, you let it stay there. Now the mind will fight this sometimes. They'll say, this is getting boring, nothing's happening. You have to tell it that this doesn't matter. What matters is you're learning a particular skill, how to stay with one thing, how to set up a good intention and stick with it. And of course the thought that it's boring, that's one of your first distractions. What's the allure of that thought? The way it says you look at the allure and then you compare it with the drawbacks. Not following that kind of thinking. And if you really look fairly, you can see that the allure is pretty weak. The drawbacks are pretty strong. That's when you can let it go. Like that analysis that the Buddha had right now. These thoughts come up. Are they constant or inconstant? Well, they're inconstant. The word anichang, sometimes translated as permanent or impermanent. That translation doesn't quite get to the meaning. Anicca is the opposite of anicca. Anicca means something you do repeatedly, constantly. If something is inconstant, it's undependable. That's what the Buddha is getting at. There are certain things out there that you know are impermanent, but compared to your life, they say, well, the mountains over there, they may be impermanent. But they're permanent enough for me to build a house. So. But if the mountains are shifting all the time, and that's what inconstant means, then you realize that this is no place to build a house. That's one of the drawbacks of your thoughts. You can't depend on them. Not only are they inconstant, but they get you to do a lot of unskillful things. And then they run away. So if they're inconstant, they're stressful. And the Buddha says, if they're inconstant and stressful, are they really worth holding on to? It's a value judgment. And this is another reason why we try to get the mind in a good state of concentration, because you've got something better to hold on to. So you compare the allure with the drawbacks. And you can do this many, many times, because all too often the allure is something the mind is afraid to admit to itself. And so it'll lie to you when it talks about the allure. So you find that you let go of this particular kind of thought, and it comes back, which means you haven't really seen the allure. So you have to question it again. Because there may not be simply that it's pleasant. Sometimes we have a sense of obligation for certain ways of thinking. We just feel, if I didn't think in these ways, I wouldn't be me. Like we mentioned just now, we develop certain patterns of reacting to certain events, reading certain situations in a certain way. And we keep reverting to that. 
But you have to remember, there must have been some point in the past where you, prior to that particular pattern, you were still you, you could still survive. So it's good to think of these voices in the mind as being members of a committee. Like right now, you've got many of the members all together here working on the concentration, working with the breath. You've got some other members, though, have other ideas. They're waiting for a lapse in mindfulness, and then they'll come out, take over. But the fact they can see them as separate members of the committee makes them easier to deal with. If it's just you, 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 with everything that comes up, you feel like if you drop these things, then you're dropping part of you. If you understand, the mind creates lots of different senses of self around its different states of becoming. You've got a whole stable in there. And you don't need to keep all the horses in the stable. Some of them are getting old. Some of them are troublemakers. Those are the ones you can put out to pasture. This makes it a lot easier to let go. Because you're creating good things to hold on to inside. With the concentration, with the mindfulness and alertness and other good qualities you're developing right now. So you can step back from a lot of your attachments and see, I really don't want to believe that anymore. I really don't want to go there anymore. And as the mind gets more and more quiet, you'll see things a lot more clearly, and a lot of the allure that was hidden from you becomes more apparent. These things come very quickly in the mind. So if there's a lot of background noise in your awareness, they can hide in that background noise. You don't see them. But things get really, really quiet, and you get quicker and quicker at detecting when a thought begins to stir. You can begin to see why you go for it. As the Buddha says, with some of these cases, as soon as you see it, you realize, I don't really want that, and you let go. Other times you have to reason with yourself. So the discernment here, it's one of the reasons why there's no one discernment method or one insight method. In fact, the Buddha didn't give any methods at all, aside from asking you to question things. Why do you go for that? What are the results? The questions are very basic. And it's good that we keep things basic. If we get very abstract, a lot of things can hide in the abstractions. This is one of the reasons why the Buddha was such a pragmatic teacher. You can think about it. What he saw on the night of his awakening and the seven weeks afterwards was all pretty amazing. He could have spent the rest of his life talking about what an amazing thing awakening is. But he realized that wouldn't accomplish anything. Instead, he spent all that time teaching the path so that other people could have the same experience themselves. So this is where we focus on the workings of the mind like this. to see where we're being foolish. As the Buddha said, discernment comes when you ask the question, what would I do will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness? What would I do will lead to my long-term harm and suffering? You see that your actions are important, and that long-term well-being is possible. And it's better than short-term. Basic, basic wisdom. But the Buddha showed how you can follow those questions, take it all the way to awakening, where there's no suffering, no limitations of any kind. So we hold on to the path to take us there. 
And we deal with the nuts and bolts of how our minds lie to themselves. Because that's the message of the Four Noble Truths. It's not just that there is suffering. Suffering is the things we cling to, and we think we're getting something good out of them, and yet we're suffering. So our ignorance is not just innocent not knowing. We're lying to ourselves. We're ignoring all the suffering we're creating. And one of the reasons we get the mind into concentration like this is so that we can be more and more willing to see the truth of that, and also to see how we don't have to keep on acting that way. So all those Velcro hooks, the things that have the allure of our thoughts, can get stripped away. And the mind can be free. <laughs>